So today we're here to discuss uh, the context and motivations for planning. Uh, and I believe I was asked to be here for two reasons. Uh, the first one is because I'm an elected official. Uh, and so I've uh, had a lot of experience in, uh, in the past eight years uh, in, in dealing uh, with the issues that, that arise uh, from just the increase in recreational use that we're seeing within the valley. And, uh, and that experience has, I think, helped me to understand, uh, I guess, be a little bit more compassionate about putting myself in other people's shoes as well. Uh, and I think that that's something that we all need to do. We need to realize that these uh, public lands are everybody's lands. Uh, and that what some people find fun is not necessarily what somebody else is going to find fun. But there's enough uh, land out there. There's enough, I think, uh, capacity for us to all be able to go out there and enjoy those lands the way that we uh, feel is appropriate and fun for us. Uh, I like to relay a story about <clears throat> the first time I skied the Phoenix Bowl and ran up the uh, North Face Lift, and then you got to ski down a bit, then you got to hike up uh, and hit some great bowls and, and some great skiing. And then about the third time around, I hollered at the guys who were taking me because I'd never been there before. And I said, hey, guys, what's this? And they said, that's a ski pass. I said, no, that's a lift ticket. Right? I don't want to hike to do that stuff. Some people do. And so, <laughs> so we have to keep that in mind that, that you know, people recreate differently and they enjoy recreation differently. And so for what one person looks at as how in the world could they be, do that, someone else is sitting there saying, you know, how can they do that? And so, so we've got to figure out ways when we're going into a long-term process that will give everyone the opportunity to be able to enjoy our public lands the way they like to enjoy them. <coughs> so the other reason uh, I think that I was asked to be here is uh, because I am uh, an avid snowmobiler. Uh, I'm part of that motorized community and uh, so I have a very good perspective on uh, the, pu the pulse of how the motorized community feels uh, and where they're coming from, uh, where some of their defensiveness might come from. Uh, and I think some of it is quite legitimate. Uh, some of it is maybe a, a little stronger than it needs to be. Uh, I think here in the Gunnison Valley, we have uh, done some great, great strides over the past, I'll say uh, 15 years uh, to try to get people uh, <clears throat> to be more understanding of, of, of what's going on and, and to stop throwing rocks. There's still rocks that are getting thrown and whoever gets hit by him, it hurts. But uh, we, we need to get past that. Uh, this is the, the law of the land now. We've got to go through this process. And every time I see it as a great opportunity uh, to engage a community and to engage different multi-use recreational users and to create better understanding between those users so that we don't have, and I wish we could spread that out to more parts of this country, but I think we need to get away from this litigious uh, attitude and area that we're in right now. It's just, it's just not productive in my experience and we, know that there are radical fringes on both sides of these issues that have no intention of being constructive because uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, you know, it's, it's this type of thing uh, on a national level has become big business for a lot of people as well. And so there are some people out there that have a uh, mindset that you know, this is how they make their business, and so they're going to keep doing it. And so no matter what we do here with this travel management, I can tell you that more than likely this is going to some people that are going to oppose it. And, it, you know, hopefully it doesn't go to litigation, but uh, that's a possibility. But I think that the people in this room are the ones that can make the 
the decisions and choices and participation that will create a plan that will be effective and will be accepted by everyone. Uh, and I think that this is where the uh, decisions ought to be made. They ought to be made at a local level. Because uh, we're the ones who are here, we're the ones who have to do it. <coughs> so for me, there's, there's a, in the context of motivations, that's a pretty broad uh, statement, right? Uh, but basically we're asking, uh, why should we do this? So uh, as a county commissioner, I'll quote James Carville from 1992, it's the economy, stupid. And from the avid snowmobiler, I'll quote Rodney King from 1991, and that's can't we all just get along? <coughs> I'm going to start with the it's economy, stupid. Outdoor recreation is a growing industry which is outpacing the nation's GDP. According to the U.S. Department of Commerce, in 2015, it grew by 5.5% versus a 4% GDP. In 2016, it grew by 3.8% versus 2.8 GDP. So it's growing at about a 25%, 20% faster rate than GDP. I'm going to bore you with some statistics. <clears throat> in 2016, outdoor recreation accounted for 2% of the total national GDP. That may not sound like a lot, but that was over $373 billion. Billion here, a billion there, next thing you know, you're talking about real money. <laughs> uh, so let's pick one sector of outdoor recreation to, to kind of focus in on, on what this really means economically. And since uh, I'm the one that's up here, I get to pick, and guess what I pick? <laughs> So there's an average of 30,000, uh, over 30,000 snowmobiles registered in Colorado. <clears throat> Most are in rural communities. And, and uh, you know, this is a rural community and this is an economy uh, that is based on outdoor recreation. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. We have some great uh, institutions here that really drive our, our economic engine. Western State is one of them, our hospital is one of them. Uh, CBR is one of them, and our ranching community, uh, you know, creates a great GDP for our county, but tourism, which is basically outdoor recreation, when you talk about Gunnison County, is a huge, huge part of our GDP. The regist registration trend in Colorado is up 219% from 2000 to 2014. Uh, most of that occurred before 2007. Uh, there's been a slight downward trend uh, since the recession, uh, but I don't see that as being a long-term trend. Out-of-state registrations are up 493%, almost 500%. Uh, and that was in the 11 years. That was from 03 to, to 2014. So uh, you didn't know that figure, obviously, uh, but you knew it was happening, right? Uh, our public lands here in Colorado have been discovered not just by snowmobilers. Everyone is coming here. In the state of Colorado, there are 13,000 households with an average of 2.5 sleds per household, an average of 200,000 trips or outings by residents, and 46,000 trips by non-residents a year. So put a figure on that, uh, an average of 130 million in expenditures on trips. All those trips are west of the I-25 corridor, right? And I would venture to say that most of them are in a 20 county region. And uh, I would say that we get our fair share. Uh, the estimated economic contributions to Colorado in uh, the 2014-2015 season from snowmobiling was over $252 million. That's money spent here locally, and we've all talked about the, mul the multiplier factor. The dollar spent here, that person is paid wages with that money, he spends it here, it runs around the community before it finally goes out. But a lot of that money that we're seeing 
is coming from out of this county. So we get to get that money in here, we get to hold on to it a bit, roll it around a bit, and eventually it goes to Amazon.com or somebody else. <laughs> but while we can have it, we, we want to use it, and, and it helps. It's big. And again, this is, you know, we're talking about snowmobiling, but, you know, motorized, skiing, uh, backcountry, hiking, fishing, hunting. I mean, start multiplying this. And, and snowmobiling is, is uh, a fraction of what uh, the summer motorized stuff is. So, I mean, economically, uh, don't kid yourself, it's, it's important to our community. And so we need to figure out how we can make this work, uh, both in the summer and winter. And, and I'll, I'll pull you out, but I'm, I've been very happy to have uh, Matt come in because he understands that as well. And, uh, and he's gonna work collectively with all of us to see if we can't come together uh, and get our heads around something that works for everyone and that doesn't step on anybody's toes or uh, unduly uh, take away some of the freedoms that, that uh, certain users have in certain areas. Can't we all just get along? That's the second reason I'm here, right? <coughs> so we get the big picture. Economically, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, a big deal for us. We have a golden goose. Uh, if we don't come together and do some planning, we will kill that golden goose, plain and simple. Uh, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to see where this is heading uh, if we don't plan. Our uh, county uh, emergency officer uh, is fond of saying, if you fail to plan, then go, go ahead and plan to fail. I mean, so so let's, let's go ahead and and wrap our minds around this and say, well, we're gonna plan to do this. And Keith, I think you were part of the Gang of Nine. No, I'm not, I'm not that old. Okay. Uh, well, it was in, back in 94, in and uh, you know they did some planning back then that, that has really uh, been beneficial and has worked uh, for 25 years, right? Uh, but things have changed, and that's something that we have to realize on both sides of the issue, that things change. And, uh, and so we have to be proactive enough to be able to uh, change our plans to compensate for what those changes uh, are bringing. Uh, we have to do it differently. Inherently, user groups don't trust each other. And that's something that a lot of people in this room can, can fix. Uh, and that's only way that's going to get fixed is by coming to the table with the right mindset. It's no rock throwing. Come to the table with the attitude that I'm going to put myself in this person's shoes. Hopefully they'll put themselves in my shoes and we'll try to figure out, okay, that makes sense. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to have when a travel management plan, if you're a snowmobiler, that's going to be like the summer travel management plan where you have to stay on trails. You know, if I wanted to do that, I'd move to Minnesota. A whole lot more trails there. So people have to understand what it is that makes my sport fun for me. Start from that and then say, okay, so what can we do in this plan to make that happen so that people can have fun doing what they do? Uh, I'll tell you a, a little bit of some of the success that we've done and some of that we haven't had that I've seen, just to kind of put a nail in this, uh, have to do it differently. There's two ways of doing it. One of them is, if you remember a few years ago, uh, some people went to, I forget what it was called, something creek trailhead uh, that BLM had closed uh, north of Montrose and ripped down the sign and said, basically, this is uh, a public trail. It's always been a public trail. It shouldn't have been closed. It was closed illegally and went out there and did that. Uh, that one ended up, obviously, with people arrested and in jail. We had a similar situation here in Pitkin, where some people uh, were going to open up some trails that had been closed, a whole bunch of them. And as a county commissioner, I stepped in I knew a lot of the people and I understood their frustration because the planning process, and we'll talk about that in a bit as well, 
But uh, what we did there is said that there's a way that you can work with the Forest Service to change plans. Nothing is in stone, right? Everything is fluid. And so, yes, we worked at the speed of government. It took four years. Uh, we sat down with some groups and said, you know, what, where were some of these closures egregious and why were they? And, and we started off with, you know, probably 15 trails that we would like to see reopened and had a dialogue with the Forest Service and found out why some of these places were, were closed. And, and we narrowed it down to about eight trails that we wanted open that we felt were important to us. And in the end, uh, there's four or five trails that, that are going to be open. So there's a process and there's a way to do this. The failure that caused the Pitkin situation was, a, in my opinion, a bad a process that wasn't, uh, I guess, in tune enough to, to get everybody's input properly up front. And, and so the plan that came out, I do think, went too far. And that's because it was being pushed by those that want everything closed, and it was being opposed by those who want nothing closed. And so from a land manager's perspective, you know, how do you wade through that? So, so we need to be part of the process. The one criticism I'll have of the process is it takes too long. And frankly, uh, from the environmental side, it's a, across the, the county, there's a huge, uh, it's a huge business, and there's a lot of people that are paid to be part of these processes. I don't see that on the motorized side. And so it's people that take their time off at home. If these meetings aren't at the right time, if there's not progress being made in these meetings, uh, that is a forward momentum. In other words, we come back and you're in your fourth meeting and you're still hashing out stuff that you hashed out the meeting before, that you hashed out the meeting before, and there's no, it's not going anywhere, then eventually you start seeing the participants decrease and you end up without input from them. And those who are being paid to be there are going to continue to give you input. And so it, it tends to skew some of these things. And so that's something that I would ask the Forest Service to be aware of, that. A lot of people out there that are in the motorized community are younger, have families, have jobs, they're just trying to make it, and meetings are not uh, their favorite thing. Me, you know, I signed up for this, so I, I'm into meetings. One of our successes that came out of the Gang of Nine, and I would look like some water if somebody had a glass, I, thanks. Uh, the Gang of Nine had a program that kind of did the north end of the valley. Uh, Washington Gulch was part of that. Uh, and we were still having issues. Uh, snowmobiling was discouraged. So it was allowed, but it was discouraged. And there was a lot of people uh, that liked to ski there. And a lot of them liked to actually use the snowmobile tracks to ski out to hit the powder on some of these bowls. And part of the problem was that a lot of these bowls were being tracked up before skiers had a chance to get to them. Now, as snowmobilers, we realized, you know, we can, we can create distance pretty quickly, right? That's why we need big areas because, you know, we're not going a few miles an hour, we're going 30, 40 miles an hour. And what we decided was, by putting ourselves in the skier's shoes and saying, imagine getting out there to the trailhead, seeing a nice untracked powdered bowl, strapping on your skis, slugging out there. For me, it's slugging. I know you enjoy it. <laughs> slugging yourself out there, hiking up this bowl. About an hour later, snowmobiler pulled up, jumped out two or three of them, got off their, their machines, hit the trail, and said, wow, we love that powder too, right? And so here you are about two thirds of the way up, and next thing you know, and in 10 minutes, the whole bowl is tracked up and you're gone. And so the snowmobile was like, yeah, that makes sense that, you know, that's part of, why would they want 
that and we can go further down. So we came up with a solution saying, all right, we'll leave that hill alone for the skiers. Let's go on further. And this is the kind of thing that we're going to have to sit down and work together. But I'll go back to the inherent mistrust of users that is out there. And there's a lot of people in this room that perpetuate that mistrust. And so we need to, we need to do that differently. And I think that uh, with this program here, we'll be, we'll be able to. Uh, I'm committed to uh, working on it. I'm committed to uh, not saying keep it all open, but I will uh, say one more thing that gives us motorized people a b bad name. And every time, I haven't seen it lately, but uh, used to be every time somebody wanted to talk about the woes of snowmobiling, you always saw the same footage of back in the 70s when these old smoky snowmobiles were all parked at Yellowstone and, and the Forest Service are, are wearing gas masks. And, and it's like, see, these guys are horrible. And that was what the, you know, what the one side was pushing. And then the other side is saying, these guys don't want us anywhere. Uh, and that's true for some people, but there's a sweet spot where we can keep that pendulum. You know, if, if you're part of the, of the radical edges, do me a favor, don't participate in this process. Just stay out of it. Uh, those of you who want to come to the table and do the hard work and make some sausage like the Gang of Nine did uh, 25 years ago, uh, come to the table and, uh, and respect everybody. And again, we're not going to like everything comes out of it, but uh, the motorized community, you, know, you look at the, the chart that showed how much 50 something percent is available to snowmobiling, but remember that our perspective is 100% of it is available to skiers or to hikers or whatnot. And, and so, uh, and we understand too that the other thing is, is equipment has changed, right? And so it used to be in the 60s and 70s, we had 100% of it available to us, but we couldn't reach 30% of it, right? Uh, nowadays, with, with uh, technology you know, and with equipment, which I really enjoy, uh, you know, we can access so much more of it. And so, is it appropriate to sit down now and say, you know, should we, should we take a serious look about where should we be going with these things that can go anywhere? I'll give you that, but uh, but it's not this much. We need motorized vehicles need more acreage, and every time we come to a table. The bottom line is everyone wants to compromise, and to us, when we hear compromise, it means, okay, compromising means how much are you willing to give up? And it's hard, so you guys have to understand that, those of you who are on the other side, that that's, that's just a hard position for us to be in, because we know there's only one way, when you start with 100%, there's only one way to go from there. And so uh, we understand that, but, but you guys need to think about that when you're at these tables uh, working on these and, and, and interacting with different groups. And, and I promise I'll do the same. I understand that you want powder and different things and quiet in some areas. And there's some places that I think that we can find that that will be appropriate that won't be detrimental to me enjoying my zipping around in the powder. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks,